good. We're going to start right on time. That's what we're going to do. We certainly do not want to keep the bishop waiting. <laughs> All right, everyone. I am going to just make a very uh, uh, brief introduction of the man who's going to introduce uh, Bishop Barron. Uh, Brandon Boat works for Word on Fire Ministries, which is uh, the uh, organization that uh, then Monsignor uh, Robert Barron did the Catholicism series. Father. Yeah, oh, oh, was he? He was never a Monsignor? <laughs> All right, and uh, <laughs> but of course, you know, catapulted to, to, to television fame in the in the, the mode of uh, another bishop, uh, Fulton Sheen, and uh, and he, a very very big Chesterton fan, and, and uh, I had the great privilege of meeting him in Rome when we did our pilgrimage because he was there for the installation of the. Hope and some of our, our kids ran into him and said, Dad, Mr. Hawks, we, we, met, we met Father Barron and he knows who you are. And they thought that was amazing. <laughs> of course, I, I never met him, uh, but that was great. Oh, I, I, and, then this, and then some others said, Well, Mr. Hawks, will you take us up to meet uh, Father Barron? And he was up in the NBC booth up on top of our, our state place where we were staying, right overlooking St. Peter's Square. We, really land in a good place to stay. That's what happens when you book your rooms six months in advance of a pope being installed. <laughs> you, get, you get really good rooms. And uh, we had the best rooms in Rome. And uh, so we went up there and I, I just uh, walked right into the studio. I was wearing a fedora and sunglasses. Uh, walked up to Father Baron and said, Father? I said, yes. I said, I said Dale Alcorst. He said, Dale! And he goes, he puts his arm around and goes, this guy knows more about Chester than anybody in the world. And <laughs> Maria Shriver and Matt Lauer looked up and he said, there was... <laughs> Talked with uh, with about 20 of our kids and just they loved it. It was a really great moment they got to spend with him. Uh, like the moment that we're about to spend with him live via Skype. So I want to introduce Brandon Vogt, who's going to introduce his excellency. Thank you guys so much. Uh, first of all, thanks to Dale. He's been so gracious to us. You've probably sensed through the advertisements of this conference that we had a little bit of a problem getting Bishop Barron from Los Angeles all the way to here. So this is sort of the, the consolation that we're going to connect via Skype. Uh, tonight, after we do this little Skype uh, conversation and the Q&A, we're going to offer the world premiere screening of a new film that Bishop Barron has made. Uh, the series is called Catholicism, the Pivotal Players, and it looks at six different key figures in the life of the church. Scholars, artists, mystics, saints, and G.K. Chesterton is one of them. Uh, I'll let Bishop Barron explain why he chose Chesterton and what these pivotal players are, but essentially they're people who not only shaped the church, but changed the world, as Chesterton continues to do. Uh, the series doesn't come out until September 1st, so three or four weeks from now. This is the first time anyone in the world has seen this episode on G.K. Chesterton. So uh, we're always going to be And everyone at Word on Fire, which is the ministry that Father Barron runs, uh, wanted me to make sure to emphasize, you can pre-order the Pivotal Player <laughs> series. And uh, we have a special discount code, $20 off. If you use the code GK1874, the year of his birth. So go to pivotalplayers.com and use the code GK1874. It's only good for a week, and it's only good for people here. So you want to make sure that you go and pre-order your copy now. And uh, as I'm sure Dale would emphasize, if you're saving $20, you have an extra $20 in your pocket to go outside and pick up a brilliantly designed mug or some books. So it's a win-win all around. All right, well, uh, what we're going to do is connect uh, via Skype. We tested this out. I hope everything is going to work with Bishop Barron. 
He's going to offer like a five to ten minute introduction to the film, to G.K. Chesterton, and then we'll have time for maybe three or four questions before we uh, screen the episode. So I'm going to pull up the Skype here, and we'll connect. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Bishop. Uh, you probably need to turn on. There you are. No. Oh. Thank you. I can hear you all. Thank you very much for that. Now, can you see us? Because we can definitely see you. Can you see us? Uh, I can't. Okay. <laughs> I see your face, Brandon. Oh, okay. You gotta change the camera here. Hold on. No, oh, I can't see you yet. That's all right. Well, you trust, can see. trust me that this is not an audio recording. We're really here. No, I can hear you all. I believe you. All right. So, Bishop, we I just gave a one or two minute introduction to this series, but we were hoping you could maybe talk a little bit about uh, the Pivotal Player series in general and why you chose G.K. Chesterton. Yeah, well, let me just give you a little, maybe a wider uh, perspective, a, a deeper background to it, which is my, you know, great affection for Chesterton. Um, you know, first of all, my, my greetings to all of you. I, I'm just delighted we're able to premiere this video to this audience. I can't imagine a better audience for this Chesterton uh, episode. So thank you for taking the time to, uh, to attend to this episode. Um, I, I think... Your role in keeping the uh, memory and thought and soul of Chesterton alive is, is a tremendous gift uh, to the church, the wider society. So thank you all very much for that. Good. Can you still all hear me? Yes. Let's get a little funny feedback. Can I tell you a little bit about my history with, uh, with Chesterton, how it started? I was 19 years old. I was a sophomore at the college seminary outside Chicago. And this was 19, what, 78? So it was the high water mark of post-conciliar sort of confusion. And I had to fulfill an English requirement. And the only available option was, of course, in G.K. Chesterton, taught by Father Stanley Rudke. I don't know, maybe some of the members of the society remember Father Rudke. He was a great Chicago priest, um, high-level musician, composer, conductor, and a Chestertonian. Well, at the time, I had never even heard of G.K. Chesterton. It just fit into my schedule. So I took this course, and uh, Reinke had us read, you know, Orthodoxy, The Everlasting Man, I think several Father Brown stories, etc. And I became, from that moment on, a uh, passionate uh, Chestertonian. And I'll say this, there are a couple of moments in my own development that were really touchstones during a pretty confusing time. So some, I'm sure, in that room were old enough to remember the 1970s and the early 1980s, um, not the most focused time in terms of the Catholic intellectual tradition. But when I was a, uh, when I was a freshman at Fenwick High School outside Chicago, a young Dominican friar taught us one of Thomas Aquinas' arguments for God's existence. And that changed my life. I've told that story many times, but Thomas became the great touchstone for me at a very confusing time. I would say Rutgers course in Chesterton was something very similar. It gave me a sort of light and a, a point of reference during a confusing time. Right after that, I got the Baslin Scholarship, which is a philosophy scholarship at Catholic U. And again, I was living at the seminary at a time when it was a pretty poor liberal, but I had people like Robert Sokolowski and John Whipple, Thomas Trufer, who were wonderful Thomas and representatives of the classical Catholic tradition. And that, again, was kind of a touchstone for me during those confusing years. But Chesterton played a very important role for me during that time. You know, this might surprise some members of the society, but another person that, uh, that kept me on the Chestertonian path was Father Andrew Greeley. Greeley was a great devotee of Chesterton. And uh, in my early years, as a teacher and a writer, encouraged me very strongly to keep studying and following Chesterton. Um, what would I take from Chesterton? And you'll see a fair amount of this in the, uh, in the episode tonight. 
The first one is what I call in my writings a bipolar extremism. And that's, of course, the idea from orthodoxy that it's not you know, black alone or white alone, but it's, it's and not be a compromised black and white, but both at full strength. Um, famous line, isn't it? You know, it's the red flag wave and the white flag waving, and the church has always had a healthy hatred of pink, says Chesterton. <laughs> so it's not one side or the other, nor a bland compromise, but both extremes at once. And of course, that's grounded in a good, solid Christological logic. Jesus is not simply human or simply divine, and not a sort of Aryan uh, monstrosity, semi-divine, semi semi-human, but in that very peculiar logic of Chalcedon, fully divine, fully human. And that's, of course, ground to a unique manner of God's transcendent. Anyway, all of that, I think, is behind Chesterton's wonderful intuition of this bipolar extremism. And I found that that's one of those ideas, if I can borrow Flannery O'Connor's line, that sheds light in every direction. And I've used it over and over again in my own writing and my own thinking. Um, here's the second thing from Chesterton that stayed with me over the years. Remember in the book on Thomas, he says that the best way to characterize Aquinas is Thomas of the Creator. When I was a doctoral student in Paris many years ago, um, I was thinking about my thesis, and I knew I wanted to write on Aquinas. And at that time, Joseph Oxinger, who was head of CDF, wrote a little paper and he said, there's been a huge interest in anthropology since Vatican II. And that's true, you look at you know, the kind of Ranarian line. But he said, we need to discover again the importance of creation. And he said, I wish young theology students would write about creation. Well, when I read that, I immediately thought of Chesterton. And I thought, yes, Thomas of the Creator. And so that inspired me to write my doctoral paper on creation in the text of Thomas Aquinas. And I focused on the de potentia, that wonderful disputed question on creation. So anyway, Chesterton very much haunted my own thinking on that topic. The last one, and it comes through very clearly in the uh, episode, is Chesterton the Happy Warrior. So we all know he's the guy that goes out with the sword stick and he battles you know, the, the false ideas of his time, but always did so in this blithe, uh, happy manner. I came of age, you know, again, right after the council. It was a time of a lot of unhappy warfare, if I can put it that way. A lot of people on both sides of the divide battling with each other, uh, largely over sex and authority. Those were the two big issues when I was coming of age. And you didn't see a lot of happy warriors. You saw a lot of angry warriors. And I always found in Chesterton, especially in that relation with Shaw and you know, others, this wonderful model of how to enter the lists with verb and with passion, with panache, but also with, um, with love in your heart and with uh, a joy in your attitude. So that, I, I hope, has had an impact on me as I do my own uh, work. Uh, just a word about the filming of this episode, which was a great joy. We started in January 2015, and it was great. We went to London in January to film Chesterton and Newman. And uh, it's a great time to go to London because it's foggy and cold and rainy. <laughs> and so the scenes have a very, you know, English feel to them. And remember the line, it wasn't Chesterton's line about he loved um, every kind of weather except what people call beautiful. So he didn't like, you know, the blue sky and sunny which I have here every day, by the way, in Santa Barbara. Uh, but we were there for very Chestertonian kind of weather. I loved filming in, in London. We went to Beaconsfield, of course. The most moving moment for me was visiting Chesterton's grave in Beaconsfield. And I love the fact that on his uh, tombstone, it doesn't you know, celebrate the life of G.K. Chesterton, but rather it's a plea to pray for him and his wife, and so I, I followed the, the command of the tombstone and indeed prayed for him. But that was a very moving experience. We went out to the um, uh, Oxford Oratory, and that's where we saw a lot of the artifacts, the hat and the sword stick and the cape and the typewriter, which I found very moving to see Chesterton's uh, typewriter. So all that was a, was a great joy. We filmed uh, the Newman episode too on that same trip, and that was wonderful. We also went down to the University of Notre Dame uh, to kind of commemorate Chesterton's famous trip to Notre Dame, and you'll see that uh, in the episode tonight. You know, Brandon, the opening question you had for me was why we chose him, and 
I chose him first because I love him. But secondly, I think he's really a pivotal player because he's a great evangelist. And that's what we call him in the series, the evangelist. Especially, I'd say, for our time, this time of the new evangelization. And I just see Chesterton in that happy spirit, his willingness to engage the, the errors of his time, but also that way he just had the intuition for the fundamental things. Um, I don't know anyone that cuts to the chase, chase clearly that Chesterton does. And uh, that I found him as a great evangelical figure and a model of, for our time. Uh, you get it from Lewis, you get it from Newman, uh, you get it from Peter Crave today. But what I get from Chesterton is this keen awareness that the most interesting and compelling intellectual offer on the table is classical Christianity. You know, the, the fashions come and go, and, and I've lived long enough to see a fair number of intellectual fashions come and go. I think of the people we read in the course of my life, oh, you've got to read so and so, oh, this is the latest thing. They've all come and gone. And what remains of the most compelling option on the table is a classical Christianity that has a robust sense of the divinity of Jesus, the reality of sin, salvation, grace, God's existence. And that's what I'd like to, in my own small way, try to stand for and to make the case again today uh, for the, the, the sheer joyfulness and intellectual compelling quality of classical Christianity. That's what I got many, many years ago when I was 19. Uh, from G.K. Chesterton, and that's what sustained me really all these years. So I hope some of that comes through anyway in the video. It's only, what, about 50 minutes? How do you bring all of Chesterton into a 50-minute video? We made our attempt. So uh, I hope you enjoyed the, the video. And pray, please, for the success of this uh, Pivotal Players series. The original plan was to do 10 of these, and it was interrupted by my becoming a bishop. So we had to stop our filming. But we're very hopeful that we can resume and, and finish this business. But I'm delighted that the Chesterton one got finished. If you like the process of the series, it's the same team that put it together. Same musician, same director, same cinematographer, uh, same writer, composed. So uh, I hope you do enjoy it. And again, God bless you all for uh, taking the time to watch it tonight. Introduced me to Chesterton, so I'm glad uh, you knew him. He was a great man. A great man indeed. Uh, we're going to see if we have any other questions here. I think you've you've absolutely wowed them to the floor here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Your Excellency, your bookshelf background looks identical to what it is in Chicago. I see that wealth of books. 
I'm wondering how long it took you to move it. <laughs> I just lost it. Did you hear that, Bishop? No, I, I could just hear you. I lost it there for a second. I could just hear you now. Okay. Go ahead. The question Maybe was, you could repeat it, Brandon, for me. Yeah, the question was, your bookshelves look equally impressive in Chicago and Santa Barbara. Ah. How long did it take you to move all the books and arrange them? <laughs> Good. Can you hear me okay? Yes. It took uh, a long time, and they were just arranged, I'm happy to say, by a wonderful student from Thomas Aquinas College, which is in my region here. And I was away at Krakow for World Youth Day. And so we hired this nice kid, and he came out, and I said, just get my books in order, because I had thrown them in boxes and threw them up on the shelves without any order. So he put them in beautiful order by genre and then alphabetized them within the genre. So it's the best organized bookshelf in my office and upstairs in my room that I've ever had, thank God. <laughs> thank you, I was happy with my bookshelf. Your Excellency, uh, you've been a part of the hierarchy now for a short time. Your experience so far, do you find that the, the Magisterium, American, the American bishops, have any sense of a commitment to Chesterton? There's an influence of Chesterton on our present uh, a good, USCCB. Yeah, I, I'm not quite sure how to answer it. I know there were certain people in the conference who loved Chesterton. I know that. Um, can I see the precise influence of Chesterton? I don't know. I don't know. It's probably too early for me to tell. But I know there are certain key people there who love Chesterton. And those of us who are committed to evangelization, there are a lot of bishops who are very committed to it. Um, would certainly instinctually move toward Chesterton. But it's, I'd be happy to, to bring it up in a more pointed way at the Bishop's Conference. Uh, why not take Chesterton as the model for the new evangelization? Uh, hi, uh, this is Alejandro, my senior at the University of Miami in Florida. And uh, good. First of all, it's great talking to you, Father. I looked at uh, all of your YouTube uh, videos and they're really inspirational. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, I just recently encountered Chesterton uh, and there was kind of a barrier at first uh, due to his language and his way of being is really different to the way uh, for younger generations, how we talk nowadays. How can you say we can maybe lower, or not even lower, just how can we make it more approachable to younger people nowadays so that we can get them on fire with the same zeal that Chesterton had? Yeah, no, good, thank you for that. I think one is to take some of the key ideas and translate them. So I've tried to do that in different ways. So you can distill some of the key ideas. At the same time, I would say, let's urge people to drink from this wonderful champagne, which is G.K. Chesterton. And you're right that we become so flattened out in our rhetoric, and we're not used to the sumptuousness of his prose. I mean, I, I, every, every page of Chesterton is like a bottle of champagne. So um, let's accustom young people again to that. Now maybe we have to do it gradually. Just as when you're teaching Shakespeare, you don't just you know read Hamlet and report on it tomorrow. I mean, you really bring people through it gradually. Teach people to savor the English language and the very unique usage that Chesterton had. So distill the ideas, yes, but let's not give up on the, uh, on the beauty and the density of his, of his prose. Uh, which really, if you all know, repays the effort to understand it. Your Excellency, last question. This is Dale Alquist again. Uh, and uh, the, we have over 300 people here in the room. Uh, there is great devotion to Chesterton. I think we, we represent what could be called a cultus. <laughs> The, uh, the, the question on a lot of our minds is what, what do you think uh, is going to happen with uh, moving towards the cause for Chesterton sainthood? Yeah, I have no inside information I can share with you, but gosh, I support it. I mean, I uh, have felt since I read Chesterton, and, and you, you all sense that, you know what I'm talking about. Not only a great writer, not only someone who sees things deeply, but you can sense it in his writing, his own sanctity. Then the more you know about him, the more you love him. Do you remember when Mary Tan was talking about Aquinas? And that's what he said, was the more I read him, the more I love him. And I always found that with Chesterton. Um, I'm convinced he's a saint. Uh, I, I think he will be canonized. Now that's no inside information, believe me. Um, 
By one connection, I, I know Father Paul Murray, a great Irish Dominican who's on the Saints congregation. And in fact, Paul is visiting out here in Santa Barbara next week. So I might ask him, uh, you know, any, any movement on the Chesterton cause. Uh, so I don't have any right now inside information. But gosh, I would, I would very heartily support it. That's good enough for me. <laughs> On behalf of the uh, American Chester Society, uh, Your Excellency, thank you once again for the good work that you do throughout the world, but for, for making this video and for sharing your time with us right now. Well, Dale, God bless you for all you've done. And I, I don't know if you remember this, but many, many years ago, before I met you personally, I emailed you because I was looking for the, a source for a Chesterton quote. And I thought, I think I found on, on your website or something, I emailed you. And within an hour, you got back to me with the complete information about that quote, and I thought, pretty impressive. So I was impressed by you before I met you. Uh, <laughs> I'd be grateful for all of you, and let's, uh, let's pray together for the canonization of Chesterton. Amen. 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 Thank you all. God bless you. Hey, Bishop, before you leave, can you give us all a blessing? I'd be very happy to. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon you and remain with you forever and ever. Thomas Aquinas, microphone. <laughs>